I am on a mission to create the ultimate ecosystem vivarium. And I've already begun the groundwork. Planning, choosing a location in my home to build it, ordering the glass and materials, and most fun of all, choosing the animals that will be living inside it. The over 1,200 gallon tank vivarium will be complete with living ant colonies of mine, an array of tropical plants, fungi, prey creatures, parasites, detritivores, possibly a waterfall, river, and a pond, and of course, predators. I knew from the start of this project that in order to succeed in constructing this ultimate ecosystem vivarium, one of the prerequisites would definitely be having a good team of predators because they keep populations of prey insects and animals from overpopulating. In nature, having a biodiverse score of predators in an ecosystem is a good indicator of a healthy ecosystem. And my, has Mother Nature crafted some supreme predators with such stunning diversity into the most surprising of shapes and the most adept of hunting techniques. And needless to say, I just love predators. And it seems the majority of you who are subscribed to and watch this channel also share a love for predators above all organism types in an ecosystem. Based on a poll I ran this week, now I've been mulling over what selection of predators I want to add to our ultimate ecosystem vivarium. Because, well, you can't just add a bunch of predators into a tank and expect them to coexist. Several things could go wrong. They could eat each other, injure or kill each other over territory or food, or completely exhaust the shared prey supply in the vivarium. I knew compatibility was key here. And this project was already testing all my skills and knowledge I've acquired over my lifetime of animal husbandry and nature knowledge. But guys, I have some great news. I believe I've come close to achieving the official list of predators for our vivarium. And in fact, this week, I'm thrilled to already introduce to you today two new arrivals, both awesome predators, currently in my ant room, just waiting patiently to be rehomed into our ultimate vivarium once built. I also have others on the way, but I'll be needing your help and opinions today with finalizing my official predatory species wish list. So stay tuned because I want you all involved with the decision process as we embark on this adventurous biological journey to build the ultimate ecosystem tank, the largest terrarium build I've ever done in my entire life. This is part two of creating an ecosystem vivarium. As we take a look at potential predators, we'll be adding in what predatory species of animals will work best for our ambitious ecosystem vivarium, which predators can coexist in a single enclosure and not fight or eat each other. Shall we add an apex predator to the vivarium? And would such a thing be safe for the ecological balance we're trying to achieve? What are these first two new predator animals I caught for our ultimate ecosystem vivarium? It's time we explore the amazing world of predators and find out. Welcome to the story of how I build the ultimate ecosystem vivarium here on the Ants Canada Ant Channel. Please subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon. Welcome to the AC fam. Enjoy. Guys, it's my greatest honor to start this huge ant vivarium project with you all. And as mentioned in part one of this ecosystem vivarium series, there couldn't be a better time to embark on such a vivarium building journey with you guys than now, as it would be the perfect celebration of reaching 5 million subscribers on the channel. At the time of creating this second episode, there are a little over 13,000 subscribers left until we hit that milestone. So guys, my hope is that the AC family finally reaches 5 million subs at some point during the course of this long-awaited ant ecosystem series, for which I have some very big and exciting plans. So if you're watching and haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do hit that subscribe button so you too could follow and be part of this truly groundbreaking milestone experiment. 
I truly appreciate the support and cherish every sub. All right, so as mentioned, I have two very prominent predators from the ecosystem of my yard that I can't wait to show you guys. In this video, I'll be feeding them and building them a luxury terrarium suite as a temporary home until we complete the construction of our ultimate ecosystem terrarium, which may be a few more weeks from now because the glass and framing is all being manufactured right now as we speak. In the meantime, I'm using this period to research, research, research. I'll also be going over what other predators I'm thinking of adding in to our vivarium. But as mentioned, I'll be needing your help with something regarding that later on in this video. So do stay tuned until the end for a very important question I'll be asking you, as your opinions have already helped me immensely with this undertaking. Also, for the purposes of this video, this episode will cover vertebrate predators only because I feel the vast world of invertebrate predators can be covered in an entirely separate episode. Okay, so let's begin. Within these holding containers, I have two very exceptional predatory animals that I believe will bring great vitality and health to our ecosystem vivarium. They're common predators in my yard and contribute to controlling the populations of prey creatures that make up their diet in the wild. Let's start with this container. As you may have already noticed, it's partially filled with water, with a stone for an island, which can only mean what you ask? You guessed it, amphibian. And there it is. This here is a forest frog, a tree frog of sorts. And my, look at that cryptic color pattern. It just screams, I'm just a piece of mossy bark. You can move along now. On the underside, you can see its white underbelly and sticky toe pads. So cute. Guys, what should we name it? Leave your name suggestions in the comments. Now, I often find these frogs sleeping in random receptacles containing bodies of water, including vases, random pots of water around my home, and within moistened plants. I also see their egg masses in my pond, and again, in any receptacle of water that may be laying around. I believe it to belong to the genus Platymantis, although I'm not too sure. Any frog experts want to take a stab at what species of tree frog this is? That impressive camouflage that cosplays mossy bark, as you will see later, truly helps them remain invisible to predators and even their prey. AC family, it's time we feed our tree frog here. Hello, Turkestan roach. It's time you bring nourishment to our newest creature to join our ant room. Frogs usually require live moving prey in order to stimulate the feeding response. So unlike with my ant colonies, this roach will have to be fed alive. I wonder how hungry our tree frog is. Let's find out. I carefully open the top of the container and tap the roach inside. The roach instantly swam to the island as it struggled to climb up the walls of the container. Will the roach's movement wake our frog up? But suddenly, the roach fell into the water and completely lost control. The frog remained completely still, still cosplaying mossy bark. The roach continued to try climbing out of the water, but was having troubles. I considered possibly trying to help it out but I opted not to, because I felt the frog was likely scared of me, which was why it still wasn't moving. Perhaps if I just didn't move and pretended to have gone away, our frog might decide to go in for the kill. I continued to wait. Come on, Roach. You had one job. To be the food for my frog. Just kidding. Well, not kidding. Eventually, the Roach managed to climb up on the rock on its own. Yes. Now for sure the frog could go in for the kill. I waited with bated breath as the roach began to wander the rock island. I anticipated the frog would pounce at any moment now. And then, sploosh, the roach slipped and went in for a swim again. Seriously, how can you guys survive a nuclear apocalypse and not this little body of water? 
Anyway, we'll come back to the frog and its meal. It's time to show you our next predator. Oh, you guys will love this guy. It's currently hiding under this rock. And voila! Meet our super cute sun skink. At first, it seemed a bit startled by the sudden missing rock, and it began to snoop around for another place to possibly hide. It flicked its tongue to smell its surroundings. This little guy is a type of lizard, and it's still young. But I see them scurrying around the forest edge and my lawn, basking in the hot sun, then retreating into shadowy dark places when all heated up. These guys are super fast and hard to catch. But seeing it now was just amazing. What should we name it, guys? Let me know in the comments. I marveled at its smooth, shiny golden scales, lined with bands of black and a grayish belly. I find our sun skink here super cute. How about you guys? Its streamlined body helps it fit into little tunnels and spaces between rocks and rotting wood in order to hunt the prey insects that it eats. And well, guys, I've got just the thing it's looking for. Gut-loaded roaches. And again, they need to be fed alive and moving. Let's feed our little dinosaur, shall we? As I went in from above to drop in the roach, the lizard looked up at me inquisitively. I was surprised he wasn't dashing away for his life. Where I live, there aren't really a lot of people around, so perhaps I'm one of the first humans he's ever seen. But for sure, this roach wasn't the first he's seen, as forest roaches make up a good part of their diet in the wild. My heart jumped into my throat the moment one of the roaches approached the lizard, who stood perfectly stiff. What? Okay, no. It's moving now. And doesn't see the roach, maybe? The roach stood perfectly still for its life, and then at just the right moment, darted away with the speed of Americans on Black Friday. Was our lizard not interested in food at the moment? It actually seemed much more interested in me, literally looking at my face as I went in to watch it. Before going on with its business, looking for what I guess was a place to hide, and then it approached another roach. Would it finally eat this one? Nope. It seemed much more interested in exploring the alien container it was in. Guess our lizard wasn't so hungry. Man, the roach gods are really working overtime tonight. I watched several moments when the lizard totally could have gone in for the kill, but the lizard didn't. My guess was it wasn't the right time of day. It was currently nighttime, and these lizards are diurnal, hunting and feeding during the day. So it was probably really confused right now and was staying up way past its bedtime. He was probably looking for a place to spend the night and get to bed. As for the frog, still no eating. I think it was really hoping to convince me that it was mossy bark. Well, I had just the thing both these animals needed. It was now time to create their luxury suites to properly welcome them home to the ant room. AC family, behold! the empty tanks into which we will be moving our two new predators. I have some very special plans for both these tanks. As you may have guessed, this tank, with its awesome amount of vertical space, would be perfect for our tree frog. And this tank here, with its greater horizontal space, would be great for our terrestrial sun skink. Together, they would make up the luxury suites in which our tree frog and skink would be residing until our ultimate vivarium was complete. So, I went straight to work. First, a drainage layer. I used some crushed coral I had laying around, but gravel or anything coarse also works. This drainage layer will ensure the soils don't get waterlogged, which can kill plants, and that there are no anaerobic spots, which could produce toxins for many soil creatures. Next, for ground medium, I used cocoa peat, but I will also be using some bioactive soil to ensure these terrariums are somewhat self-cleaning at soil level. And after two hours of work, this was the end result. AC family, behold, the two luxury suites of our new predators. A cloud of humidifying mist enveloped them as they awaited their future beloved inhabitants. Let's open the tree frog's terrarium. 
Ah, there we go. And blow into the Sun Skink's terrarium home. So, what do you guys think? I wanted to make it look like the two terrariums were somewhat connected and part of the same world, while also providing each animal with what it needed most. If we do end up housing these two animals together one day in our ultimate ecosystem terrarium, the challenge will be having to provide each of the animals' specific needs into one setup. Now before we move our predators in, let me show you around the territories. First, the tree frog suite. This tank is a lush and tall tropical waterfall corner of paradise that I think our tree frog will truly enjoy. It's got ground plants, rocks, and its premium feature, a waterfall with crystal fresh waters for our frog to enjoy and spoil itself when it's not cosplaying mossy bark. It's important that our tree frog doesn't dry out and has a supply of water to keep its skin hydrated. I've also decked the suite out with some broad-leafed plants, Syngonium, which will offer the tree frog cover in case it wants to hide. I've also placed in a long and winding branch for climbing. Overall, I feel our tree frog will truly love this slice of tree frog heaven we've made for it. All right, now let's move on to next door, to our Sunskink Shangri-La. This terrarium features a basking spot under a heat lamp and UV bulb for our lizard to sunbathe and heat up as it so wishes. Towards the cooler end of the tank, we have a variety of plants. And guys, check this out. My favorite feature of the tank is this. This protruding rock here is the cover to a secret hidden master bedroom fit for a sunskink. Here is the entrance to the masters, but we'll need to keep it dark if we're to attract the sunskink in for bed. So placing back this magnetized rock cover, Ooh, I just can't wait for our little guy to discover his hidden chamber. I made sure, by the way, to place all plants and his hide far away from the basking site, as the heat can be too much for the plants and for the lizard once it's all heated up. Oh yeah, forgot to mention, our sunskink also has a refreshing little pool to soak himself and have a drink from. And now we see family, it was time to move our two predators into their new homes. First. The tree frog. He sat on his rock island, looking at his new home with wonder. And with a little guidance, he happily leaped into his new suite. I then slid on the front cover. So cool! There he was, chilling out at the back. It seemed he was still cosplaying Mossy Bark. But my, did he look awesome and pretty at home in there. I was amazed at how well he could stick onto the glass surface with his sticky toe pads. Hope you like your new home. Oh, come on. I know you aren't Mossy Bark. No need to pretend. Seriously though, it was definitely amazing to see our tree frog in a more naturalistic home. I was already starting to love the little guy. All right, next. It was time to move our sun skink into his new luxury suite. He too gazed at his new home through the acrylic as I opened the top and carefully guided him inside. He leaped down and dashed for the ferns. At first I couldn't see him, but in just a few seconds, I spotted him, sticking his curious little head out. See him? He was breathing heavily, probably jarred by the transfer, but soon he relaxed and began to inspect his new surroundings. He made his way on top of the rock, which made up his sleeping quarters. Oh, would he find his secret hideout? He proceeded forth to explore some more and past his master bedroom, wandering to the other warmer side of the tank. I loved watching him explore as he made his way to the rocky outcrop of the basking site. Hmm, this place is rather warmish, he thought. He stayed there for a good minute, soaking up the warmth. Oh, how I loved watching him all sprawled out, absorbing those rays like he would in the wild. What a cute little sunskink. But wait, if our lizard was basking and thinking it was daytime right now, 
I wondered if it would be willing to eat now. A roach. I dropped it in. Suddenly, a movement caught our skink's eye. And bam! In for the kill. Without a second thought. Wow, that was awesome! The skink proceeded to consume the tasty fattened roach. It swallowed the entire roach whole. Well, wasn't that a tasty treat? Now we know if this lizard does move into our ultimate ecosystem vivarium, roaches will definitely need to be an available prey insect. Hmm, how about another? I dropped it in, and in a flash, the sun skink appeared on the scene and went in for the kill. Yum! How awesome to be able to witness this live feeding. How I love reptiles! What was amazing was after these two very filling roaches, our sunskink found the hottest basking spot in the territories and sprawled out to proceed to bake, which would help him digest his food. It was truly awesome to see that our lizard was already making himself at home and using the amenities of his brand new luxury suite built just for him. He stayed in this basking spot for the next 10 minutes, not moving, just basking. Eventually, when he was hot enough, he began to move and continue on with his exploration expedition around the territories. He climbed the ferns, checked out the big giant rock again, went back to the rocks, basked again. I couldn't wait to watch him crawl into the hole. I mean, being a diurnal creature, he must have been so tired by now. I watched him crawl back to the basking spot where he basked for a third time. And that's when I realized I was probably jet lagging the poor guy. And I should probably turn off the daylights now, so he could go to sleep. I tried feeding the tree frog, but watch what happened. Food crawled right over it, as it insisted to me that it was mossy bark. Okay, I get it. The frog wants me to truly be gone first, and lights off. I turned off the lights, and decided to come check up on them in the morning. The next day, I checked up on the predators. Our frog was right there, hanging out on a branch, after a night of exploring his tank, and he probably ate the roaches I stuck in there for him, as I couldn't find any anywhere. Now seeing him against the wood like this, I could now fully appreciate how effective his camouflage actually was. I could easily pass this unsuspecting piece of mossy bark, wouldn't you guys? Wink wink. But we see you! Alright, let's leave him be, even though we still see him. Our lizard had not yet emerged, probably sleeping in from staying up so late. But I couldn't help but wonder, had he found his master bedroom? I removed the rock cover and was shocked at what I saw. What? Empty? Guess this hide wasn't so sunskink approved after all, which only meant that he was likely hiding somewhere else, probably beneath the tufts of moss all around the territories. With his streamlined body, he could have literally dove head first into any of these softened mossy places all around the lands. And after thinking about it more, I felt this was a very wise choice. To seek out a much more tight and hard to get to space, because our secret hide here was still pretty cavernous, and the opening still rather large, large enough for a medium-sized snake to fit into and eat him, which is a real danger these lizards need to contend with. It makes sense that the sun skink would instinctively sleep in a hard to get to space every night, perhaps burrowing tightly underground for his own safety from other predators. But this brings me now to where I really need your help. So I have an admission, guys. As I was filming today's episode, I had a change of heart. I'm now actually at about 50-50% sure I still want to keep both Frog and our cute lizard. The reason is twofold. First, after seeing them in their individual suites, and as much as I really love them both, I realized that they are still wild animals. Now, I don't mind catching and keeping wild invertebrates from my yard, but for some reason, I struggle now with ethics again regarding catching wild reptiles and amphibians. 
Ah, why do I have such a double standard conscience? I almost feel the right thing to do is release both of these guys back into my yard. Because it just doesn't seem right to confine them into these suites, or even a huge 1,200 gallon vivarium, after they've known the freedom of the expanse that is the outside world. Keeping them captive now seemed a bit hard for me to deal with, ethically. Second reason is regarding an apex predator. So AC family, hear me out. I've been struggling with the idea of an apex predator for our vivarium. There are two apex predators that I'm thinking of ordering for our vivarium. And unlike our frog and sunskink, these apex predators will not be wild caught but will be captive bred pets. As soon as I make the official decision, I can order them at any time from an exotic pet breeder friend of mine. But AC family, I'm undecided if our vivarium should house one of the two following. Chameleon. I grew up raising chameleons since I was a teen and have always been fascinated with them. Visually, they're striking with their ever-changing colors slow moving and graceful and generally easy to feed for me they're one of my favorite lizards to keep as you know we've had a veiled chameleon on the channel before but sadly i had to rehome it during the pandemic ant room apocalypse where i had a feeder scarcity issue due to lockdowns in my city and had to downsize my pet collection drastically well i no longer have that problem today and feel our vivarium might be an excellent home for a chameleon I'm unsure if frogs and or medium-sized ground lizards like our skink would be safe though, because I'm certain a hungry chameleon would go for anything that fits into its mouth. So I don't think we'd be able to house much else if we had a chameleon patrolling the vivarium. Another thing about chameleons is that they also eat plants. So it might be a substantial herbivore in our vivarium, which may or may not be a problem. The second apex predator I'm considering possibly getting is a toke gecko. Man, this has been a dream lizard species since I was a kid, and they're also native to where I live. But wild toke geckos are protected. I can legally source a captive bred toke gecko from my breeder friend, so it's definitely possible for us and our vivarium project. These lizards are huge and a bit scary and eat a lot of insects. But just one of these geckos would be like having a T-Rex patrolling the vivarium, capable of consuming a lot of prey insects and other animals in the tank. Frogs and smaller lizards would be in constant danger. But then again, should I even be worrying about other creatures, seeing as an ecosystem is simply what we're trying to achieve? In other words, if for instance our cute sunskink ever failed to burrow underground by night when the toke emerges, and fall prey to a toke gecko? Wouldn't that just be the ecosystem working as it should? Why am I okay with insects being eaten, but vertebrates not? I don't know, double standard again. But bottom line, if we do get an apex predator, we will not be able to have a bunch of other smaller predators running or hopping around. Also, we cannot have both chameleon and a toke gecko living together in our vivarium because I know tokes are notorious for being pretty vicious. So I would fear for the chameleon's safety, as both lizards are arboreal. Anyway, do let me know what you guys think. Should we get a chameleon or a toke gecko or neither and just stick with a team of smaller, more placid predators that can live together? And about our tree frog and sunskink, should we just set them free back into my yard? I can always buy captive born and raised frogs and lizards for our vivarium. And the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm feeling good about this option. There are many other possible tropical lizard and frog species worthy of our vivarium that can possibly live together in a setup and eat insects. Like red-eyed tree frogs, dart frogs and mantellas, although note that these frogs eat a lot of ants, Madagascar day geckos, crested geckos, house geckos, and various smaller agamid species, even a rough green snake which only eats insects. But again, if we choose this route with a community of predators, we cannot have an apex predator like a chameleon or a toke gecko wandering around in the vivarium. Regardless of what we choose, it is still amazing to learn all that we are on this vivarium building journey. So cool to watch our lizard eat 
and to know that all it took was a more naturalistic environment for both animals to feed. Same goes for our mossy bark cosplaying tree frog. I've always believed that it's important we provide our pets, whether they be lizards, frogs, or ants, the best homes we can possibly give them. Oh, and speaking of giving our pets the very best homes, real quick, for those of you wanting to get into the ant keeping hobby, as we do every year at AntsCanada.com, it's our annual AC holiday sale. Just use the coupon code ANTLOVEFOREVER2023 to get 10% off all ant farms and outworlds at our shop, as well as a free ant keeping handbook, which has all the info you need to get started in ant keeping. Just add it to your cart. Our ant starter kits make great gift ideas for any nature lover. Go check out AntsCanada.com and enjoy your ant shopping. The promo ends January 1st, 2024. But going back to our vivarium project, I can't wait for its final completion. I think it's great that together we are researching, laying out our plans, and making all the tough decisions now so that when it's time to build our ultimate ecosystem vivarium in a few more weeks time, it will truly be a biological marvel to look at and observe. So again, please be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet to be part of all the fun and this historic terrarium build. I can't wait to see where this project heads to next. So stay tuned because next week when we return for our next step in our quest to build the ultimate ecosystem vivarium, I have something very special planned. Until then, thank you all for watching and supporting the ants. It's ant and predator love forever. Hope you can subscribe to the channel as we upload every Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video to help us keep making more. It's Ant Love forever.